Wonderful. Welcome, everyone, um, to the dissertation defense of Hemlata Swaminathan. Um, I'm Stefan Julich, and I just want to introduce uh, our committee and Hema and say a few words before we turn the floor over to Hema. So first, Hema's uh, external committee member is Ivia Wolfa, PhD. Ivia is an independent researcher in Jungian and archetypal studies. Her research explores cultural narratives for insights into cultural trauma, necessary transformations and healing, drawing on her experiences of living and working in Europe, South Africa, and North America. And uh, Hema's internal committee member is Dr. Debashish Banerjee, who needs no introduction to people from CIIS and East West. He's the Haridas Chaudhary Professor of Indian Philosophies and Cultures, Doshi Professor of Asian Art at CIS. He's also the Program Chair for East-West Psychology Department on sabbatical currently. Prior to CIS, he served as Professor of Indian Studies and Dean of Academics at the University of Philosophical Research, Los Angeles. He's taught as adjunct faculty at the Pasadena College, City College, University of California, Los Angeles, and the University of California, Irvine. His interests lie in postmodern, postcolonial, and posthuman approaches to Indian philosophy, psychology, and culture. And Dr. Banerjee has curated art exhibitions, authored books and art catalogs, and lectured widely across the globe. He can also be found all over YouTube. Hema um, is actually the first student that uh, I've worked with all the way through to her defense. So this is my first uh, defense as chair. And I'm just really happy to, for, it, for the first student that I've worked with all the way through to be Hema. Hema came into the program in 2021. So we're here at 2024, and this is kind of a record speed that Hema has worked through uh, her PhD. I've very rarely seen students get through so quickly and with such determination. Uh, she came as a practicing psychologist with a practice in Sufism, and very soon after she came, she became a student assistant with the program, so I got to work with her closely when I was the program manager, uh, and then she became a TA for my classes, two of my classes, and then became my advisee. So she's also uh, a practitioner of the dance form called Bharatanatyam and uh, has the soul of an artist, as you'll see in her, her presentation. And I just wanted to mention this morning, as you know, I, I teach classes on Western magical tradition, and I have a practice every morning where I do some journaling, and I chose two cards this morning. These are the two cards. The one in my left hand is called the grindstone, and the one in my right hand is called the harvester. And after I chose these cards this morning, I realized these are really for Hema. The grindstone, um, this, these both come from the um, magician and practitioner named um, Josephine McCarthy. What McCarthy says about the grindstone is that when the grindstone appears in a reading, it tells of a period of intense work or potentially necessary hardship or necessary limitation. It's the power that holds the magician back, and I would say the student also, so that they can perfect and learn new skills. It slows the magician's work and helps with the formation of the vessel or body's boundary, shape, and polish. It can also indicate the need for self-discipline. The magical adept learns to work with the grindstone um, and the unraveler, which is its opposite, in equal measure to keep the scales balanced and to keep power flowing, but in a healthy, controlled, and mature way. This means that the magician must constantly pay attention not only to their magical work, but also to their health, their home, their resources, and how they conduct themselves in daily life. So you can see that it's a perfect card for somebody who's got a full life uh, work family, who's also attempting to complete their dissertation. The harvester card, um, the harvester is a power that brings things to conclusions. It harvests the crop, be that crop a life, a cycle of fate, learning, or time. And there was a wonderful quote that was uh, given from uh, Haruki Murakami, it's Kafka on the shore. Once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure, in fact, whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what this storm is all about. So that's for you, Hema. 
Uh, very quickly, I just want to tell folks the way that this is going to proceed. Uh, Emma is now, I'm going to turn the floor over to Emma. She's going to give her presentation. And afterwards, we'll do two rounds, maybe three, of questions from the committee, starting starting with uh, Dr. Evi and then Devashish and then me. Um, we'll go through the two rounds. And if we if there are any more questions that come up, then we'll ask them. And then we'll adjourn to excuse me, a breakout room and uh, leave you folks with Hema and you can ask any questions you like or just get into a, a chat with her. Okay, Hema, this is all right. Wonderful. So I'll turn the floor over to you now. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Stefan. I'd like to begin with sharing my screen first. And um, I'd also like to mention that this dissertation is a bit longer than the usual. So it would probably take around 55 to 60 minutes. And I thank you in advance for your patience. So after that wonderful introduction by Stefan, I thank my committee members and the audience for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be here. I'm uh, Himlata Swaminathan. I'm a practicing psychologist with a deep interest in the intersection of psychology and the healing potential of the human psyche. In my years of practice, I have witnessed the transformative power of understanding one's inner world as a path to healing. This belief has inspired my dissertation research, which focuses on designing an embodied ritual to explore the psyche and engage in self-healing. The core of my work has been to develop an approach that blends psychological principles with embodied practices. I'd like to share some of the topics that I would be covering today at a glance. The objective is to introduce a unique method for exploring the human psyche through an embodied ritual which is inspired by Hume's house dream. The method, the embodied ritual consists of three steps within the sacred space designed to evoke unconscious material and integrate it with conscious awareness. The organic inquiry methodology, which centers on storytelling and transformative experiences emerged as the most suitable approach for this research. I'd like to throw light on what an embodied practice is. Yato hasta tato drishti, yato drishti tato manaha, yato manaha tato bhava, yato bhava tato rasa. This verse in Sanskrit from the ancient Indian text Natya Shastra elucidates the role of embodiment in experiencing a spiritual connection. I learned these verses when training in Bharatnatyam an ancient form of Indian classical dance and understood these verses as, let your eyes follow your hands, for then the heart follows the eyes and there is expression. And where there is expression, there is the connection to spirituality. These words insist on paying attention to what one's hands are creating and experiencing life through embodiment and creative expression. Hume, the Swiss psychoanalyst, described how the hands are capable of fantasy when one experiences what he defined as a conscious cramp. What I understand from this is the hands engaged in creative activity can comprehend and solve the question that has been struggling to unravel. Thus, the embodied engagement could establish a connection between the conscious and the unconscious parts of the psyche. This research introduces a unique method for exploring the human psyche through a three-step embodied ritual inspired by Hume's dream, Howe's dream. Today, I'm excited to share with you my research titled Arangam. So one may ask, what does Arangam mean? It's a new word. In Tamil, this word signifies a stage or space specifically prepared for an embodied ritual. As a Bharatanatyam dancer, and Arangam has been a sacred space where I have experienced a deep connection with my art, allowing me to embody and express the divine. I named my research Arangam because, like the sacred stage that connects me with the divine, my research seeks to create an embodied ritual to explore the psyche. In this research, 
Arangam refers to the physical structure I built, inspired by Hume's house dream, which became a sacred space for an embodied ritual. This research was a response to an intuition. Smith, a Hungian analyst, pointed out that intuition differed from thought as one cannot decide to have an intuitive idea. One does not initiate an intuition. Instead, one receives it as something unknown that arises from the unconscious. Hence, I became the vessel for intuition to manifest a physical model of Hume's house dream, consciously perceiving and attending to it as it revealed different aspects of my psyche. In honoring the intuition, I'd like to also mention a little bit about my background. That has been a very important part of this research. Being a creative art therapist, I have been deeply inspired by Hume. My introduction to Hume was not through his concepts, but through his art and how he spoke of art as a healing modality. His self-exploration through art has been a huge influence on me and his house dream led him to understand the key concept of the collective un unconscious in analytical psychology. The life he lived in an embodied manner through art and sculpting has been the motivation behind exploring the house dream in an embodied manner. As an Indian, rituals have been central to my life, helping me connect with the universe as divine. These rituals have enabled me to establish a connection with nature and art. This has been my motivation to explore the psyche through an embodied practice. Through my practice of Bharatanatyam, active imagination and creative expression, I have observed how material from the unconscious manifests itself in creative forms. These practices have been instrumental in designing the embodied method for this research. Yoga and Zikr have been my spiritual practices providing me deep insight of my chakras and in my research, the chakras emerged as a secondary source of data, providing useful insights about my psyche. So this research is around the curiosity whether an embodied ritual could inform the scholar of their psyche and that forms the crux of this research. In trying to pursue this research, I began to wonder what would it mean to build an embodied, to create an embodied practice inspired by Hume's house dream to explore the psyche? What would the components of this embodied ritual be and how would they inform the psyche? And how would reflecting and documenting the in embodied ritual inform the scholar of their psyche? So these questions um, formed the basis of uh, the data of research data and obviously the first um, step uh, that uh, was part of this research was the physical structure like I felt intuitively that I needed to build a physical structure based on Hume's house dream. Uh, the second source of data and also the step in this research are the elements from nature um, and the third is active imagination and creative expression. So as much as these are primary sources of data these are also the three steps of the embodied research, of the embodied ritual. What also happened as I went, up, went ahead in my research were uh, certain secondary sources of data emerged because of my personal practices. Um, the chakras, because active imagination is a very, and creative expression, are very embodied practices. And as I was engaging in that, I could feel my chakras also giving me information and I had to pause and observe them. And some sketches which I had made over a decade, like maybe five to eight years ago, were also bringing up similar themes for me. So I had to pay attention to them, observe them and pick up these themes from them. Um, and they seem to relate to, they do relate to a lot to what the research is about. So though not planned before, these two sources of data became my secondary sources of data during the research. So what is this house dream, which I have been speaking about, and many of you would know about it. However, I will briefly take you through it in terms of uh, what you uh, mentioned about the house dream. He said that he had this dream somewhere in 1928, 29, and it was a recurring dream. In this dream, he found himself on the top floor of a multi-story house, which uh, probably belonged to the 19th century. And he explained that as he descended through each floors, 
he found that each floor had a unique design and some historical associations. Um, he had he went down to the first floor. There was mention of going to the cellar, the basement. He also have has uh, spoken about different versions of the house. In some versions, they belong to his uncle. In some, to his own house. And you know, each version uh, informed him something about his psyche. He interpreted the top floor as representing the conscious self, and he believed that each floor, as he walked, as he descended, uh, was giving him information about his um, unconscious. This house dream marked the inception of Hume's theory of the collective unconscious, signifying a pivotal moment when he embarked on a personal exploration of its significance. So this dream is uh, has been very, very significant to him. And um, the structure that I built is based on this house dream. Now, obviously, in the dream, Hume, as he goes down the stairs, he has objects, he sees the furniture or the aesthetics, and he's, those things inform him about the psyche. But I'm, when I'm building the structure, I begin to wonder as to uh, what should I place in it, right? And uh, naturally, I felt inclined to use elements from nature because Hume himself linked significant changes in nature, like the contamination of water, air, and soil on the planet to diseases of blood and tissue in human beings. Uh, basically, he spoke a lot about the interconnectedness of nature and us. And um, in this research, engaging with nature was integral to the process of self-exploration as natural elements were intuitively selected and placed in the physical structure to evoke symbolic representations of the psyche. This interaction allowed the dynamic qualities of nature to serve as a mirror for the unconscious, facilitating deeper insights into personal transformation and healing. However, as I was going through my research, I came across a wonderful study. And this taught me to be mindful about the use of nature because this study said that when engagement with nature was self-driven and um, it was uh, pleasurable, and people, um, you know, believed that it was part of their identity and experienced learning and pleasure from nature. However, when it was forced or when it was controlled, then uh, they felt a kind of pressure to be in nature and found no value. And some people in this study says that some people even feared nature and could experience only a controlled engagement with it. So uh, though I chose this as a step in, uh, in this ritual because I feel connected to nature, I believe that one must be mindful before making an assumption about how people connect to nature. Active imagination, creative expression, and amplification is the third uh, element, third source of data, and the third step in um, this process. And um, Hume described it as uh, one's expectation of receiving information as an image from the psyche, and one's readiness to express the image from the unconscious creatively, a manner of preparedness and positive participation that are the keys to active imagination. It's a very embodied process as one senses emotions in one's body and focuses on the images and the story that develops and then creatively expresses the image. Uh, doing so enables one to understand the symbols that are there in the image. So uh, apart from active imagination and creative expression, uh, amplification also plays a huge role as it is a process wherein the image is elaborated and clarified using direct associations and parallels from mythology, folklore, and other streams. In this research, by expanding on key th themes and patterns that emerged during this study, I was able to draw connections between personal narratives and the broader psychological concepts. This process allowed me to enhance the depth of the findings, uncovering layers of meaning that might have otherwise have been overlooked. So having mentioned the three uh, sources of data, which is the physical structure, nature, and uh, active imagination, creative expression, and amplification, I'd like to talk about this method and how it was woven into the methodology. Like I said, the three steps of the embodied ritual are here. For, and um, step one, beginning with building the structure. Step two, placing elements from the natural world in the structure. And three is the engagement in active imagination, amplification, and then documenting and reflecting on it uh, for exploration of one psyche. This is the ritual right, that I, would, uh, that I um, wanted to create 
Um, and this is repeated for each floor. So let's say step one is building the physical structure. Now, and then step two is placing a stone, for example, on the second floor of the house. And then one begins to engage in active imagination to try and understand or what the stone means to them, what they have, how they have placed it on the second floor and what it informs them about their psyche. And then one could creatively express the same, right? Now that is one level. And then if somebody would like to explore the ground floor, then step two and step three are repeated again, right? So that's why it's an ongoing process where one repeats the ritual for each floor of the structure. I would explain this further when I talk about my process, maybe that would uh, help understand the ritual better. Organic inquiry is a qualitative methodology that fits well with this research topic as it allowed me to intuitively create, observe, and reflect on the process. So it gave me a lot of freedom to uh, explore creatively and to also observe and also uh, men, you know, uh, engage in storytelling, uh, kind of create a narrative of storytelling of my process. However, it's not, uh, organic inquiry also has a structure and three specific stages, which is preparation, inspiration, and integration. Now, these three stages of organic inquiry really laid out the roadmap for me, wherein I could uh, build my method into these three stages. And that's how came about the research design. That when I began to think about how was I going to express these steps, Organic inquiry naturally presented itself in terms of stage one of organic inquiry, which is the preparation stage, uh, was step one, wherein the building of the structure took place. Now, when one speaks about preparation, it's not just preparation or building a structure, but it's also preparation of the researcher, preparation of the intent of the researcher, and how one um, you know, brings oneself to, um, to, to, to the research. Now, stage two of organic inquiry is inspiration, and that's when step two and step three of the method um, were placed uh, or designed, um, and to be inspired by elements of nature and to be inspired by active imagination. And stage three of organic inquiry is about integration, where there is reflection, documentation of primary data, acknowledgement of secondary data, and assimilation of both to gather a comprehensive understanding of the psyche. So as you see here on this slide, uh, the research design um, came about because, uh, so, uh, because the, the stages in organic inquiry, um, you know, and the steps of the embodied ritual somehow like, you know, came in together. And I will, this directed me in a manner that I was able to, um, flow creatively, but I was also given a kind of a structure where I knew how to proceed from one stage to another. The reliability and validity of data were, were, was ensured by two methodologies or strategies. One is triangulation of research data and the other is for the 4R model by Ryan and Ryan uh, for reflection. So what is triangulation? It's a strategy where multiple sources of data or multiple observers of the same data or multiple analysis of the same data are brought together to understand the commonality in observations. And this ensures data reliability. So in this research, as you can see, there was primary data and the emergence of secondary data. And even in the secondary data, it's multiple sources, one from the chakras and the other from sketches, which I've been making for over a decade. So they're like multiple um, uh, points from which data has been collected. Uh, sources of data and uh, the reliability of this data reliability was ensured. Uh, at a glance at what the 4R model means, it's a model that is used for reflection. And I've used it to reflect on creative expression. The 4R stands for reporting and responding, relating, reasoning, and reconstructing. It consists of a set of questions that prompt reflection and foster a deeper connection to the creative expression. The prompts serve as tools to assist one in expressing their reflections and allowing these reflections to become observable and amenable to analysis, thereby creating transformative experiences for the researcher. So this has been used to reflect on the creative expression that emerged during this process. Having mentioned that, I'd like to take you through the research process um, and 
It's a narrative of how I met parts of myself, my dreams, and a goddess from ancient times. And I hope you enjoy listening to this as much as I enjoyed the process. So in the preparation stage of this research, I found myself building a wooden three-tire physical structure. It was not just a structure, but a sacred space that called for exploration. Inspired by Hume's dream, I ensured it had levels that I could explore. And then I wondered what element of nature I could place in the structure. So what you see here is the structure that was built um, for this research. I didn't force, I didn't want to force myself to start, but waited for the universe to inspire me. And that came in the form of a dream in 2122, in the year 2122, which led me on an unexpected journey into history, nature, and my own psyche. The dream centers around a dark-skinned, heavily built woman with sagging breasts and a large stomach seated on a high chair. In the dream, four men carry her out of the house. It appears as if she's dead, but I recall thinking even in my dream that she would not be sitting if she was dead. Her eyes are closed. However, just as she's about to cross the threshold of the house, she opens her eyes, winks at me and says, come find me. The dream sparked an intense curiosity within me. Who was this woman? Was she merely a product of my imagination or did she represent something ancient and forgotten? Where would I find her? Moreover, why did she want me to find her? I dove deep into mythology, amplifying the central image and searching for a woman with these physical characteristics. And that's when I was led to the goddess Jeshta Devi, a deity worshipped in the southern regions of India during the 7th and 8th century CE. Despite her once prominent status, she had largely been forgotten for not fitting society's ideals of beauty and virtue. So as you see here on this slide, this is a statue of Goddess Jeshta Devi, which is there in National Museum, Delhi. And uh, this is another statue of Jeshta Devi along with her children. Uh, this is there in New York, Gallery 240 at the Met Fifth Avenue. Now, these two are very important for what I am going to say next is months into my research and after asking around, I received a location link that pointed to a temple of Jeshta Devi in a village called Virapuram, which is just 60 kilometers from my house. I set out to meet the goddess. The temple priest at Virapuram revealed a very haunting piece of history. This statue that you see here is at the temple um, of Jeshta Devi. And as you see her seated on a high throne and the physical features are very similar two other statues which I showed you before in Delhi and in New York. So this validates that the statue that is here is that of Jeshta Devi. And why is this important is because this statue is a, a revived statue uh, by the locals. So this statue was revived by the locals when they were renovating the Shiva temple um, in, close by in 2021. And where did they revive it from? They revived it from a pond. Um, very close, this is 2021, is very close to the time when she also appeared in my dreams. This recovered idol is said to be dated over 1,300 years ago. So this um, is a temple that was built after that in 2021. Like you can see, it's a very basic structure. Whatever the villagers could manage, uh, they've put it together and uh, they do, it doesn't even have a roof. It's just a temporary shed. However, they ensure that there is offerings and there is prayers and there is uh, you know, whatever they can to honor this Devi who's, you know, been found from the pond. It really puzzled me why had a goddess like Jeshta Devi been removed from temples and thrown into the pond to be lost in time. I learned from texts that her worship was criticized and eventually erased by those who favored the worship of more socially acceptable deities, especially male gods like Vishnu. Over time, she became a symbol of misfortune and laziness traits society wanted to suppress in women. Her re rejection deeply uh, felt deeply symbolic as if she represented the very aspects of the feminine psyche that um, were deemed undesirable. Standing on this ground, I knew that I had found my elements of nature. So I collected the soil and some stones 
uh, some flowers from there and um, I came back home and I placed these elements at the basement of my structure. It, it just felt like I had to place it there, almost like a foundation to this entire research. As I placed the elements of nature at the structure's basement, and then I went into stage three, which is active imagination, um, sorry, step three, which is active imagination and creative expression at the basement. As I entered a meditative stage, a strange image appeared, a tightly bound black ball that triggered a discomfort below my navel. I opened my eyes and sketched the image that had appeared before me in, um, in active imagination. I reflected on this creative expression using the 4R model, and I realized that a part of me had not fully healed from past wounds. This black ball symbolized the parts of myself that felt trapped like a victim. This girl seemed coiled in fear, anger, and resentment, haunted by her past. Though I had engaged in personal and spiritual practices over the years, I never paused to see the girl crouched in fear. I had assumed that she would heal as I kept focusing on practices and um, keep moving ahead. But I realized that probably there was still so much work to be done. The story of Jeshta Devi, the goddess associated with misfortune and rejection, mirrors my deep fear of abandonment. Engagement with the basement highlighted how this theme of exclusion and isolation of a goddess aligned with my emotional experience of fearing disconnection from loved ones or society. So having worked on the basement, I took some time and then I realized uh, that I felt called to work on the second floor of um, the structure and you know that meant the structure was already there the step one was already done and that meant now I'll have to place a natural element and engage in active imagination but I was also very surprised because I thought that once I had done the basement maybe I'd go to the ground floor then first floor and then the second floor however this um, you know kind of instinctive uh, choice of working on the second floor uh, I was almost drawn to it very instinctively and I was I, I placed a dia, that's a handmade lamp, um, on on the second floor. That was the element of nature that I placed there, and I lit it. Now lighting the dia felt like an awakening, as if the flame had sought a place within me. I meditated, allowing the light to guide me. But first, what appeared was a dark web, tangled and dense. That's what the image that came up for me in meditation. Slowly, a clearing formed and the light found its way to the back of my head. This sensation was very new to me, a subtle center of energy that I later identified as the Bindu Chakra, where the finite meets the infinite. It was as if this newfound openness illuminated a part of me I had been blind to, raising the question, what had I been repressing or refusing to see? I struggled to make sense of the visions and feelings. However, I failed to arrive at any conclusion or response till one day I had a dream. And so in this dream, I see myself in a public place and I'm asking for a woman's washroom. I want to use the washroom. I'm shown, um, I'm directed towards it and I go into the room and the door closes. It's very dimly lit and I suddenly realize that it's a men's washroom and I want to turn and run, but the door is closed. And then the men behind the cubicles start hurling abuses at me, making me feel ashamed for landing up there. And in my dream, I know I've, I've, I've really frozen and I can't move. Um, they are, they are, uh, some of them are mocking me. Some of them are humiliating me, being disrespectful to me. It's all words. Um, and I am, uh, I, 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 uh, in my fright, I begin to run. And as I begin to run in the opposite direction, I don't know where I'll go because the door is shut on this side. And then there are a flight of stairs that take me down. I take the flight of stairs, I reach a place, and just as I take a turn to see where I am, there's this huge larger than life uh, statue of Kali, Kali, an uh, Indian goddess, and she's being worshipped by the priest. And as I see her, I begin to like really vent out all my feelings. I'm like, I, I'm asking her, why did you put me through this? When you were here, how could I go through something like this? You know, why do I deserve all the shame and the humiliation and to hear all of this? Why couldn't you save me? So that's my conversation that I'm having with her. 
And then this priest turns around and he walks towards me and he says, have you forgotten the Devi? And I'm like, where did I forget? I thought she was forgetting me, you know, something like that. And then I, I wake up and I reflect on this dream and I feel like I fled from shame in this dream and I encountered the divine feminine in a larger than life form. She was not a distant deity, but a presence within me, soft yet powerful, reminding me of my divinity. I realized then that the shame I carried, maybe of an absent father or disrespectful men, was not mine to bear. This shame was preventing me from connecting to the divine within me. Having understood that, I moved towards the third stage of organic inquiry, which is to try and integrate uh, the material that I had found till now. And in this stage is when my uh, secondary data sources um, came up for me and I had to acknowledge them because uh, as I continued my work, I analyzing sketches and connecting them to the chakras became my secondary sources of data that enabled me to gain a deeper understanding of myself. Um, I would like to share these secondary sources of data here. The discomfort below my navel was linked to the Swadhisthana Chakra. Swami Satyananda described the Swadhisthana Chakra below the navel as one's abode, the center of primal fear and desire. The sensation behind my head connected me to the Bindu Chakra, the point of transcendence. These two centers seemed to mirror the duality within me, the part trapped in fear at the basement, and the part yearning for divine connection on the second floor. I then paused the ongoing research to collect the sketches that I had made over the decade. Organizing these sketches helped me understand that this duality had been coming through in them too. However, I had not paid attention to them as a narrative. Working on this research helped me to connect to the paths and see that the path seeking the divine was being held back by the path feeling trapped. I believe I have healed on my journey. However, I also needed to pause and loosen the binds of the girl gripped in fear and shame. So if you see these sketches here on the left, you, you know, these trapped tears uh, that you can see here. And then this these two sketches here that talk of, that seem like expressions of the divine and similarly another set of sketches which i had made along that time and the three sketches that you see on your uh, left are um, of the sadness trapped or low and um, this again the sketches here seem to be of um, expressions of connecting to the divine so for some time I spent a few months meditating on the Arangam, the basement and the second floor specifically, allowing it to inform me more about my psyche. Like I thought I couldn't go on more. I couldn't, you know, get into more levels. These two itself were bringing up such um, distinct parts of me that I needed to stay with them. Creative expression of images that appeared in my active imagination during that period deepened my understanding of these two parts of me. My spiritual practices of yoga and zikr helped me to stay calm and focused as I engaged with material form from my unconscious, my shadow. Analyzing these experiences, I saw a recurring pattern in my sketches during this time. I realized that fear and divinity, once viewed as separate, were actually intertwined in my journey. So as you see the sketches here, these were made now uh, during the moment of pause and as I was just reflecting on these two uh, parts of me and most of these sketches like, you know, just reflections of how it's fear or the divine that's playing within me and some even like this one here is like um, a kind of intertwining of both these parts of me. It was nearly 18 months I was into this research, 18 to 20 months as I had progressed and I had reached a point where I thought that maybe my research was complete. You know, I had found these parts, these sketches, I just have to put 
it's put everything together. But what you see on this slide is basically in response to a question that appeared before me. What if I meditated on the intermediate space, right? Like what if I just, there is a space in between. Why am I not seeing that? You know, why am I not just looking at it as a space? As that question grew in me, a profound stillness enveloped me. I visualized the bound girl from my earlier exploration, her energy trapped and she being in pain. This time I realized that probably the fear and shame were deeper in my body. You can see I've also mentioned the Muladhara Chakra probably in the lower basement because I felt that I had probably repressed them so deep. It felt that deep. As I observed the girl, flames around appeared around her and simultaneously I felt the heat rising in my body. It was as if she was preparing to break free to pass through the purifying fire. As I meditated, I visualized a bound figure loosening, symbolizing the girl's readiness for transformation. The energy from the Swadhisthana moved up, passing through a ball of fire, representing purification. In yoga, Kundalini means one who is coiled and is envisioned as a sleeping serpent lying curled in the lowest bioenergetic center of the body. The symbolism denotes that the Kundalini is usually dormant. If a seeker is trapped in dukkha or sadness, they cannot be liberated. Through controlled breathing in which the life, that is life energy, which is prana, is withdrawn from the left and the right nadis and forced into the central pathway, the sleeping princess is awakened. In this sketch, the fire begins to dissipate as the rope loosens. The girl's energy, as the girl's energy reaches the heart, I felt, I feel a deep sense of release and lightness. Sri Ramana Maharishi spoke of the spiritual heart as different from the physical heart. Reaching the spiritual heart filled me with hope and lifted the weight of expectations off me. The image sharpened and I saw a bird taking flight, glowing with a radiant golden light, a symbol of freedom and transformation. The bird symbolizes liberation from fear, anger and societal expectations, offering a sense of freedom and spiritual transcendence. In many cultures, like the Garuda in the Hindu culture, birds are messengers or symbols of higher spiritual dreams and vehicles of transcendence for the soul seeking a connection to the divine. Through this embodied ritual, I understood the interplay of fear and divinity within me and I learned to trust the healing process. The structure I built became more than a physical space. It was a manifestation of my psyche, a place where I could integrate the fragmented parts of myself and connect with the divine. As I waited for my dissertation approvals, um, I built another structure from bamboo in my garden. Um, the first one I crafted was polished, precise, and designed to appear flawless a reflection of how I often mask my raw feelings, presenting a well-shaped exterior. In contrast, the second structure that you see on the screen now is raw, imperfect, with beams nailed crisscross, uh, in a crisscross fashion. This shift in approach feels like a mirror to my inner world. The polished structure might represent the parts of me that hide vulnerability, while this raw creation reflects a deeper, unfiltered side of my psyche one that's open to reveal itself as truly is. And now I would really like to explore this structure going forward and understand, okay, when I place things in this structure, what it informs me, maybe it would be a lot more different, but I'm really curious to play with this structure now. However, for the purpose of this dissertation, I would like to share some of the findings that emerged for me during this research. And as I do that, I'd like to begin um, by sharing um, this map of the psyche, which uh, kind of provides a foundational understanding of uh, Hume's concepts of the psyche. As you see the white arc on the right, this is the persona. This represents the social mask or the outward face we show to the world. It's how we wish to be perceived by others, often concealing our true selves. The ego, the green circle, is the center of our conscious awareness and it's kind of our sense of identity and personal reality, it mediates between our inner world and the outer world. The shadow or the personal unconscious, the brown layer, it contains repressed, forgotten or hidden aspects of ourselves. It's part of the personal unconscious, includes um, 
uh, unresolved conflicts, desires, fears that we've pushed away from our conscious awareness. The self that you see in the center represents the totality of the psyche, including both conscious and the un unconscious aspects. It is the true essence of who we are, which we strive to realize through a process of individuation, integrating all aspects of the psyche, including the sha shadow, the ego, and the archetypal elements. The collective unconscious, which you see the orange outer layer, is part of the psyche that is shared across all of humanity, containing universal archetypes and symbols. Um, and within that is the archetypal level where there's a presence of universal primordial symbols like the hero, the mother, shadow, anima, and others that shape our experiences and perceptions. In this research, I'd like to say that I believe that how I built this structure, like the polished one, um, highlighted the mask I was wearing consciously to hide my vulnerabilities. This is the persona as shown in Hume's map of the psyche. In the basement, I met my shadows formed by repressed memories and difficult emotions. That is my personal unconscious. I believe I had a glimpse of the essence of my true self, the divine within me on the second floor. However, the ego, which is the space in between that was mediating between uh, the shadow and the uh, true self, needed to trust itself more and ground itself in spiritual practices for the integration of the shadow with the self. I also encountered the goddess, depressed and silenced throughout history, dethroned from her rightful place in the collective unconscious. Now, I'd like to share how uh, I came across the specific shadow functions that I came across and how I built a tool of healing based on that. Um, so this is from a Jungian lens where Hume speaks about the dominant and shadow functions in all of us. Uh, I know my dominant functions of introverted intuition and extroverted sensation and how these have really helped me in this research. And Hume speaks about it like most people would function from their dominant functions because that's our strength. It gives us like uh, the confidence to uh, navigate this world. And that's how my dominant functions have helped me in this research that is intuition, introverted intuition and extroverted sensation, which helped me, you know, um, use active imagination and creative expression. I knew my shadow functions also. However, I just knew them. I didn't acknowledge them, embrace them or work with them before this. So extroverted intuition, which is um, response, respond by fear, um, feeling the, the sensation of feeling trapped and introverted sensation where it is the feeling of, you know, the, the tendency to internalize situations and be haunted by the past and not acknowledge my achievements, uh, lack of trust in oneself. Now these shadow functions, though I knew them, I thought they were in the past, right? That they were not affecting me now and that I had dealt with it. And that, um, so when it came up for me in this research in the basement, uh, what I felt was anger and resentment. I was like, why are they coming up now? Like, why? I, I thought I had dealt with it. And then through this research, I realized that they are still part of me. They still hold me back. And very clearly, they're not letting me go to the second floor. As simple as that. Um, and then I began to ask myself, okay, so if I begin to acknowledge that these shadow functions are still there for me, what roles am I playing? Right? Like, how are they playing out for me? What roles am I picking up? And for this, I um, went to uh, Steve Kaufman's drama Triangle, which talks about the roles we play in conflict. And he said, you know, how he speaks about um, either we play the role of a persecutor or victim or rescuer. And uh, I began to think about if I can link these roles to the shadow function. And I found that I could. Right. So when I was functioning from an extroverted intuition of being argumentative or defensive or humiliating, I was playing possibly the persecutor in, uh, in, in a conflicting situation. When I was functioning from introverted sensation, being haunted by the past or triggered by others' pain, I reflected that so maybe I was playing the victim, right? Or sometimes a rescuer, like, you know, wanting to really fix other people's lives. So this way I was able to connect and I was able to understand that if I begin to acknowledge this shadow now in my present, I will be able to follow what role I play in conflict situations. 
And then I wanted to go a step further because, you know, this is a tool we use as a psychologist in relationships. Uh, if you've heard about it, it is Dr. Harvel Hendricks' Imago Relationship Theory, where he talks about the false self, the lost self, or the disowned self um, when that we bring to relationships because of our trauma, childhood trauma. And I have worked with this. Um, and, and so I began to think about, okay, now can I extend a little further and say, how am I bringing myself in relationships uh, if I acknowledge the shadow functions? And I realized that when I am playing the extroverted intu intuition of, you know, being argumentative, defensive, or humiliating, it's a very false self. I don't want to do that, right? But when I am functioning from that shadow, this is this is what I'm bringing to a relationship, my false self. And introverted sensation, when I'm functioning from that, the tendency to internalize situations or be haunted by the past or not have trust in my achievements, it's a very lost self, as if I do nothing, confused, you know, and, um, and not believing that I can cognitively work through situations. So I'm bringing a very lost self to the relationship. And the disowned parts of ourselves are, you know, selves that we don't own because we are functioning, I am functioning from the false or the lost self. So this kind of understanding led me to build a table, like assimilate all these three, um, um, all these three characteristics and uh, all um, not characteristics, assimilate a Jungian lens of the drama triangle and the imago theory and say, okay, um, how how is it that the shadow, what is the shadow function? How is it coming up in um, conflicting situations? What roles am I playing in conflicting situations? And how, uh, what part of me am I bringing to relationships? And to this, I added two more columns, which is the thought and the feeling. Right? What is the shadow feeling when it is functioning from all of this, when it is doing all of this? What is it? What is it thinking and what is it feeling? Now, these two columns are more in terms of design, more self-reporting, reflective columns. And developing this tool gave me like a one glance um, understanding of, okay, so if I am here, what am I, what role am I playing and what self am I bringing to a relationship? And I call this tool a shadow play. It's an integrated tool for healing, which Desi which I designed on self, no, I would not say design, which I brought together, like kind of assimilated uh, based on self-reporting. And I feel that this is, um, can be, a, provide this tool, can provide a holistic pathway for healing because it would uh, help in uncovering core issues uh, that influence behavior and relationships by addressing, by acknowledging one's shadows. Um, it could help in addressing dysfunctional rules uh, that one plays in conflict situations. And it could also um, throw light on what parts of ourselves or what um, bring about a healing through connection using imago relationship theory uh, to address childhood wounds. And I believe that, you know, this uh, kind of um, expands the uh, process of healing because it's no, no more limited to just working with shadows, right? If you work with a shadow, you can go further and understand what role this shadow plays and what parts of yourself you're bringing to a relationship. And it's like, it, it just extends um, uh, into, into uh, not just understanding oneself, but also understanding uh, the relationship issues. And it offers a path to deeper self-awareness. So um, I wanted to share this here. To also add, I'd like to say that the findings uh, in, in, in this research, it explores human theories of the psyche in an embodied manner and the emerging themes of shadow and the concept of archetypal images that continue to resonate in an individual psyche and validate their relevance in the modern context. The findings also emphasize how engaging in creative process like drawing, painting and sculpting can release emotional blockages and foster emotional resilience. <clears throat> aligning with Hume's belief in the transformative power of creative engagement. Furthermore, the emergence of unique personal symbols in active imagination and creative expression reflects internal struggles, strengths, and transformations, aligning with Hume's concept of personal myth. The utility of Jungian framework in therapy, including analyzing symbols, dreams, and artwork, is found 
to provide deeper insights into one's behavior, relationship, and unconscious motives promoting emotional regulation. This research also highlights how embodied rituals such as physical movement, breathwork, or somatic practices integrated with art therapy enable a deeper connection between mind and body, facilitating psychological healing. Finally, the creation of the Shadow Play tool offers practical methods for therapists to engage their clients in a holistic healing process, emphasizing self-awareness and in self-awareness in relationships. Having explored the findings, I'd also like to mention that this uh, research also has some limitations. First, the personal and subjective nature of this research could lead to uh, could lead to biases and interpretations, which my my biases and interpretations, which heavily influence the findings, limiting the objectivity of the research. Additionally, focusing solely on my experiences as a first-person inquiry may limit the generalizability of the findings to a larger population due to the small sample size. Thirdly, the time and resource intensity required for the physical construction, embodied rituals, and deep introspective work may also limit the method's accessibility and scalability for other researchers or practitioners. Furthermore, the use of symbols, dreams, and active imagination, which are central to the method, may lead to overinterpretation, potentially clouding the findings with my personal desires, unresolved emotions, or cultural biases. Finally, my heavy reliance on Jungian concepts may not be universally accepted or understood across all psychological frameworks, posing a challenge in terms of cultural and historical specificity. However, in conclusion, I would like to say that the three-step embodied ritual offers a unique approach to exploring the psyche, and organic inquiry provides a valuable methodology for psychological research. On final thoughts, I'd like to say that this research is an encouragement to embrace embodied rituals for deeper self-exploration, and it highlights the importance of integrating personal and cultural practices in psychological studies. As scope for future research, I'd like to say that um, it could probably be expand the study with a larger sample population, so its limitations and uh, um, can be understood better. To integrate the embodied ritual into healing practices by further exploring the tool for shadow play, when I used it personally for myself, I, I felt that it was, it gave me a lot of insight, but I think we need to, uh, we could use it with a larger population to understand its uh, reliability and validity. Thirdly, it could be used, this research could be used to design a course for students of Jungian psychology, embodied research, active imagination, creative expression, and uh, subtle dreams. Um, explore organic inquiry as a methodology for embodied research. I would like to mention uh, another uh, one more scope here, which is the one theme that kept recurring uh, during my research, and I, I realized it as I was completing the research, was the recurring theme of three. And this theme of three came up in um, uh, in several places in the research. One where, for example, the structure of the triangle, it came as a triangle, the structure itself looked as a triangle. The three steps of the embodied ritual, uh, the three levels that were explored, that is the basement, the second floor, and the space in between, uh, the three theories of psychology that were assimilated to provide a framework for healing. So this, you know, number kept repeating, and I, I have very limited knowledge on this, and I could not explore this further. However, uh, my dissertation chair was of the opinion that I should mention it as future research, and Hume himself particularly recognized that numbers one to four are symbolic of different phases of the journey of the self. Uh, all I can say that probably number one was a phase where, you know, all parts of me were kind of like merged into one. Probably number two signified when I met two different parts of my psyche. Number three would probably be the synthesis of these opposing parts of my psyche, acknowledging the shadow parts of myself, framing this uh, tool, assimilating this tool for healing. And number four, I think, is work in progress, right? Because I think there's still so much to be done, so much to be explored. And I believe that this is an ongoing process. However, this is a very limited understanding of that I have of the theme of numbers. And maybe this could be uh, used for further exploration. Having mentioned that, 
I'd like to share a creative expression of what the research process meant to me. And I feel that now I'm in a place where um, this artwork would explain it further is I believe that the fears are there, but they're not, nobody is entangled in it. It doesn't hold anyone captive and it's all loose and all laid out so I can see them. Also, I feel that the uh, ropes of fear do not go into the being. In fact, the being is very well lit and as if it's like a source of light and such that it can also move into the darkness. This source of light also moves into the darkness and then um, uh, the element of fire and water are there. Uh, however, the fire seems more like a, a nurturing or like a, a provider, a provider fire rather than a burning fire. The element of water is also so contained and it seems like it's nourishing the being and the being is almost floating in it than uh, being submerged or being caught in it. So um, this is how I see my process uh, of what this has been. And I'd like to say there's a Sanskrit verse which comes to my mind is Kamasur Maam Jyotir Kamaya, like from darkness to light is how I would like to say this. And in conclusion, I would like to share a poem, a, a quote from written by Bogart, uh, a 17th century Tamil poet, which Lane Little, an American Tamil scholar, translated as follows. Time was when I despised the body, but then when I saw the God within, the body I realized is the Lord's temple. And so I began to preserve it with infinite care. And on that note, I would like to acknowledge my committee members who have been so supportive of the process. I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am today without their time, their support, their knowledge, and their constant motivation and encouragement. And a special thanks to my family for their continuous support. A word for the Writing Center, which has been amazing, the dissertation office, and of course for Judy, who's been so helpful in coordinating and ensuring that everything is in place for me to defend today. Thank you, and I would like to open the space for questions. Thank you so much, Emma. That was wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I will. I won't say anything right now. I'll, I'll talk when it comes to question and answers, and then, of course, after we're finished, uh, we can we can speak at length. I just want to turn it over to the committee members, starting with uh, Dr. Evie, if you have any questions for Emma. Yes, uh, thank you, Himalata. What a beautiful embodied presentation. What a pleasure, what a, what a delight. Um, I also want to say that I have been so impressed with the growth and development of your insights during the dissertation process. And I could observe the deepening of your knowledge and the use of Jung's contribution, uh, of course, to my delight. It was also very delightful for me to read and to also today to hear your, your very personal experiences, especially where you brought in your personal experience with the ancient goddess, Jiyeshta Devi, and where you brought in these different cultural perspectives on your experiences. And I have a number of questions, but one of the questions is related to Jung and the uh, use of how you used Jung's ideas. Um, you mentioned a number of different contributions by Jung that you used. Uh, one was the structure of the psyche, and then there were this method of active imagination, amplification, and also the typology. I wonder if you could, um, if you can distill what were the key benefits of Jung's ideas for your dissertation process. And also if you were to give sort of these key benefits of Jung's ideas for someone else who is potentially going to do a dissertation like yours. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, uh, Dr. Evia, for that question. Um, with regard to um, trying to put in words Hume's, uh, how Hume uh, or his contributions have benefited, I feel, um, especially I would feel for me, I think it's in my his understanding of the psyche 
um, is not just like a collection of mental processes, but like a as a rich symbolic space for transformation. And um, his um, contributions to art therapy, like they provide like a framework for exploring deep psychological layers, um, helping one uh, to tap into symbols and images from their unconscious. So uh, this kind of symbolic expression often leads to a very uh, integrated sense of self. Uh, when um, individuals come to terms with hidden aspects of their psyche through creativity. And um, I'd like to say with uh, the tool, uh, especially with the, the theory of shadow, right, is also very valuable in art therapy because it enables clients to uh, externalize their repressed or disowned parts uh, in a very safe and transformative manner. So the process of, um, it, 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 it often bypasses the limitations of verbal expression um, and allows one to access uh, parts of themselves that they may actually find difficult uh, to express or articulate. So I believe that um, these have been very, these Jungian concepts have been very instrumental in understanding um, and healing and, you know, creating this embodied ritual. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Himlata. I think that was a really rich presentation. And I think uh, uh, what you uh, made very evident and yet uh, didn't necessarily, uh, uh, I mean, e explicate is the tremendously synthetic nature of, of, of your presentation. Uh, the East-West nature of your presentation, the very, very strong component of yoga psychology present in your work. It's almost equal to the, to the contribution of Jung, which sort of goes under the kind of, you know, cover because to some extent the theories are all coming out of Jung, but there's a very, very powerful component of uh, theorizing out of yoga psychology that is going on in your work. So one of the things, I'm, I, and again, it, it was very rich, uh, very compelling. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it did raise lots of questions. Um, my first question to you would be, you know, in your dissertation, you mentioned certain personalities, and one of them is the curator. And mm -hmm. uh, this is a kind of exercise in auto hermeneutics you're actually interpreting your own inner life uh, and the curator job is sometimes sometimes or somehow to make sense of it so this narratology of the curator the making up of narratives uh, where do you think is the validation of that in terms of you mentioned as some of the limitations, the possibility of mm -hmm. subjective um, biases. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you uh, come to a sense of um, validation of yeah. the fact that uh, maybe you're making up this thing mm -hmm. or rather uh, something in you is trying to make sense out of a chaos and finding yeah. theories that uh, justify it. How would you yeah. uh, kind of talk to the question of validation? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, uh, Professor. And I um, I think one thing that always holds us back as our therapists is like, what am I saying? And is, is it really making sense? So that sense of area of self-doubt, the gray area is always there. But I think when it constantly keeps coming up in your sketches, in your themes, then it's almost like you cannot miss it. So I think that's one point of my secondary source of data, which is my art, my sketches, which are constantly mentioning that there is this theme that comes up. Um, and I have ignored it for a very long time. Uh, what was helpful this time, especially because I was doing it as a dissertation, as an academic work, was to look for a tool of, or that would help me with reflection. And that's where I used the 4R model uh, of Ryan and Ryan, which has helped me in uh, looking at the sketches and reflecting on them 
uh, and they are prompts. So you respond to the prompts and you see what your response is. Again, it's an authentic response and a response that's coming from you. So again, it could be the curator's response. However, it at least reduces the gray area to a great extent because you're using a tool for reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. I think, uh, as I said, uh, there was a very strong sense, a, a, a compelling sense about, about the work. And I think one of the things I felt is that um, it's not just a hermeneutics to make sense, but it's actually a hermeneutics of self-transformation. So I think that's the value of it. The fact that mm -hmm. you are telling a story, not, ju not just for telling a story, but to tell yourself uh, a kind of a, a trial and error story that will allow you to uh, to to become whole. So I think from that point of view, there is a, a tremendous coherence that a function of coherence that uh, guides uh, that hermeneutics, which I, I sense in in your work. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, Professor. I am. Thank you, Devishish. Um, <clears throat> something, not to throw you a curve, but something kind of new came up for me while I was listening to your presentation. Now, I just want to uh, let people know that that last week uh, I asked Emma if she wanted to kind of go over her presentation because she was feeling that it was a little bit long. So I actually sat with her and we went through the presentation together and it's a, what's extraordinary to me is how much it's changed over over the course of the week how much deeper your inquiry became and this is one of the really extraordinary things that i've learned about you and that i've really kind of been able to witness through this process of working with you is your your intense you have an excellent work ethic you 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 know had the tiger by the tail and you held, held fast to it throughout the entire process you got, as I said earlier, you got through in a very fat, you know, in a very short time, but the amount of light that you've generated is also really extraordinary. So I just want to, you know, honor you, honor you for that. So what, one of the things that I was fascinated with, uh, and why not in the, in the, in your dissertation was just the Davy. And I knew nothing of this, uh, of this Davy at all, except from what you've told me. And I've looked, looked her up and I found very little on her in, in the internet. But this morning, while I was, um, while I was kind of relaxing before we came on, I was listening to uh, the, a poet, uh, um, Irish or Welsh, I think, I, I don't know, but David, David White. Um, and he was talking about uh, some the, uh, a poem that he wrote called The Stone. And in his conversation, he was talking about a figure that you see on medieval churches uh, throughout Europe, but especially in the British Isles, called the Sheila Nagig. And for mm -hmm. those who don't know what the Sheila Nagig is, it's a female figure that's kind of pulling open her vulva and uh, sometimes sticking her tongue out. And it's a kind of a grotesque figure, a little bit like a gargoyle but it represents a certain aspect of the feminine that maybe was repressed and pushed into the shadow. And, and as you were talking again, as you were giving your presentation again, I was seeing a parallel. So this speaks maybe to the synthetic nature of the work. And when you're working with Jungian concepts, there's a, a way in which when you get into the archetypal world, there's an experience of what Marie-Louis von Franz called everything in everything and everything else. So, uh, in a way, these things are connected, but they, they're connected, they're only really connected if they're connected emotionally for you, mm. for the person. Mm. So these were connected mm. for me as I was mm. kind of watching this presentation, but I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about Jesta Devi, and especially this image of the, your dream where you first encountered Kali, Kali, and I just want to point out that in this card that I well, picked out this morning for you, which is on the harvester, the image of this person, this is actually the goddess Kali. You can see her tongue lolling. And Kali is often associated with that harvesting quality, but often really, really fierce. Whereas yes. I, I get the feeling that Jesta Devi is not as fierce, but there's a kind of a grotesque element also to her that maybe was pushed 
you know, into the shadow in Indian society, which is why they threw her back into the water, which is a universal symbol of the unconscious. So I'm just wondering if maybe you could reflect on that a little bit. Well, thank you, Stefan, for that question uh, or that uh, reflection, but I think it's going to, it would probably take some time, but I can briefly say that it has been a journey for me over the three, four years, since three years since I had the dream. And then I uh, uh, realized that about this goddess, though it's uh, it's even in southern part of India, not many people know her um, as the goddess. And my personal association began uh, with her when I dreamt about her. And then I went in search. And it, it's not like I instantly came upon these images and it took me some time. Uh, where, what you mean as fierce or um, maybe it doesn't reflect in the statue, but, you know, uh, just I think in, in those times, just being um, she's believed to be very powerful because there's a story that she was the first goddess to have appeared from the sea uh, when, you know, there's this whole mythology of the churning of the seas and the fight between the asuras and the uh, gods for the Amrit and uh, she is supposed to be the goddess who emerged, but because she emerged from the sea, she was like um, with dirt sand and uh, she didn't look like a beautiful goddess. And she was the first of all the uh, dirt and all of that to come with her, like, you know, maybe like how we are born with all that blood and all of that. And that itself, that appearance itself uh, made people detest her. Like, you know, she doesn't look beautiful. She's not the typical um, woman uh, that you would, that the society would say beautiful, dainty, and all of that. So there is an amount of um, um, rejection that she faced because of the way she looked. And then all other qualities um, went to the background, were not in, were not were, were overlooked. And it, to the extent that, you know, she's uh, been seen as someone who brings in bad luck. She's not kept in the house. She's supposed to be kept outside. So all these kind of misinterpretations uh, that came about, and like I said, it's very clearly mentioned in uh, the text in terms of um, uh, how uh, it was possibly to replace more acceptable male goddesses that this kind of um, cycle went where she was replaced from the temples and uh, thrown away or put into corners and removed from the central, uh, from the um, yeah, the sanctum, the inner sanctum. Thank you. I, did I, I did answer see, your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did see that she was sometimes considered to be a, a Lakshmi. A, like a she, Lakshmi, yes. A Lakshmi. Yeah, so a lot of opposites that were created, like, you know, Lakshmi and a Lakshmi. Mm. Um, I, very colloquially, she was also called Mu Devi, which is Mu is basically corner. And, you know, someone who sits supposed to sit in the corner. Uh, and all of that. Yeah, she's an extraordinary. And, and not take center stage. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. I'd like to uh, uh, give it back to Dr. Evia. Yeah, so this beautiful, beautiful uh, work you have done. And I'm really wondering about those key elements of creative expression and the healing that happened for you that maybe if you were to share with us, but also imagine as if you would be sharing them with your fellow art therapists. What were those mm. key elements of creative expression and art? Um, very interesting and a very personal question. Uh, I think a lot came up for me from these um, um, expressions of art. Um, the key elements, of course, being as much as, um, you know, uh, if I were to talk about sketches that I made before, some of the key elements that came up for me was a sense of um, not making space for myself, a space of always, um, you know, like the way the, um, in one of the pictures, in one of the artwork, there is this ball that keeps rolling. So I felt like as if I was a ball rolling from one task to another um, so what came up for me was uh, a lot of my personality and um, um, also in terms of energies, uh, energies of, um, of, you know, always 
Yeah. So how do how would I? This is very interesting that you're asking me to explain it like I would to fellow art therapists, and this is not how I would do it. I would do it in a more free flowing way, um, like really talk about uh, the colors and all of that. But I think um, the platform itself here, I'm like, hmm, should I say this or should I not say this, is making me a little conscious. Uh, I don't know what would be helpful for me to. Uh, be more free flowing with this because I'm a bit wary of, oh, am I getting too personal uh, in this space? Yeah, that is that is maybe also the reason for a question because you have written a dissertation which is very personal, but at the same time, we can see that this transformation that you are showing is clearly mm -hmm. beneficial to you more than you. And that's sort of the lens through which I'm asking this question. I'm wondering uh, if you were to be the dissertation chair for the next student who would want to do something like that, where would you sort of guide them to? What would you point out? Yes, I think that's a valuable, um, that gives me some insight now on how to go about this question. I would say, um, if I were to work with someone who's uh, using art as their tool um, to really focus on art that is coming from active meditation uh, and active imagination and um, to also probably, I would say, make art of all kinds, because as I've not shown many of the artworks, but as you can see, um, it's not always um, like, you know, OK, with art with a kind of a focus in mind or a goal in mind. So I would say to just engage in art and just to make art uh, with with anything that comes up, right? So any emotion or anything that comes up and then work on the themes or then try to put them together or then try to build a body of work around it. So I think that is what has been helpful for me also to uh, really allow it to come out, to express it, and then to see whether they that fits into the research or not or or into the theme or not mm, yeah and that this process then have shown to be transformative no matter yes. even though you don't have a specific expectation it happens nevertheless yes yes thank you and and i would like to say that you know just to add to it um dr avia is like i i don't know about transformation like i said the fourth phase it's work in progress and uh, maybe there will be more things that come up. So I would say it has been a process and it has been, uh, it has shown me parts of myself um, and it has shown me how art, um, yeah, is a reflection is, you know, really now I know to reflect on the creative work that I create. Um, and these have been the, been what it has done. Uh, and maybe, I'm, I, and definitely I'm work in progress. So the transformation is happening. Yeah, it's, it's spinning. The wheel not, is spinning. It's not coming to some sort of a conclusion because you finished the dissertation writing. It's an ongoing yes. process, but it's a process that is happening when you engage with those sort of methods, with those ways of approaching um, the yes. whatever is happening around you and what's happening in you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Avia. Dabishish? Yeah, and actually, to some extent, following up on uh, Dr. Evia's question, actually, the, the, the sense I got from reading your dissertation, uh, Himlata, was it was intensely visual. So there was a very, very strong component of engaging uh, a, a visual sensibility with uh, research uh, on oneself. And I wanted to draw attention to a quotation that you carry uh, in your dissertation uh, from, from the mother, from Mira Al-Fasa. Uh, and this is how the quotation goes. It says, uh, the discipline of art has at its center the same principle as the discipline of yoga. In both, the aim is to become more and more conscious. In both, you have to learn to see and feel something that is beyond the ordinary vision and feeling to go within and bring out something, uh, bring out from there deeper things. 
So I, I think this is happening very strongly, and she's talking about uh, yoga and art. But I think uh, yeah, underlying that entire statement is also transformational psychology, the psychology of transformation, uh, which is happening very strongly in your work. And uh, the, the sense I got, uh, I mean, even when you read that quote, uh, is that maybe it takes a lot of preparation to get to that point to make it happen, or one has to be born with a certain uh, kind of, you know, facility, uh, artistic, and I mean artistic in that deeper sense of a visual sensibility that keeps engaging with internal processes, uncovering depths. Um, do you think that's the case? And in, if that's the case, do you think that that this kind of dissertation is peculiarly suited to somebody like you rather than uh, a general person. So I'd like to uh, first speak as a scholar and then as an art therapist. Is one, as a scholar, I, I believe this is the first time, even I never thought that some I, I would be able to like kind of bring in art into uh, my dissertation. I didn't know how to do that. And so this is not something which was planned or like a goal. So just exploring and exploring. And I was like, it was beautiful that it came together this way. Um, so as a scholar, this is new for me. Um, now talking about artistic sensibilities. Um, yes, like I said, my background has played a huge contribution to the way this dissertation has come about. So definitely, um, I, I'm not, I've not learned art uh, as such. So it's just my uh, what I have explored through the years with just uh, the medium. Uh, and somehow um, when I trained as an art therapist, I began to understand that this. Now, working as an art therapist, I would say that all art um, is art. So, you know, whatever anybody puts on paper, whatever they make, whatever comes from the psyche is art. And so I don't know, I don't think there is any artistic sensibility uh, that one needs to explore this medium or to um, explore uh, art as a healing tool. Um, and um, yeah, so I would not like to limit, at that time, I would not uh, like to limit it to any artistic sensibility. Would you say, um, I mean, actually, that it's, it's a kind of a range uh, or, or a kind of a spectrum of sensibility when we use the term artistic sensibility, because some people have very little visual imagination. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not accessible and it's not, not a lack because they have a auditory sensibility. I mean, you know, our two major senses are the eyes and the ears. And it's, it's understood in neuro, uh, physiology, neuroscience at this point, that there are auditory persons and visual persons. So there could be people who do not engage with their internal processes through images at all. And then mm -hmm. those who do, uh, how significant is it to, what kind of access do they have to it? Uh, it's a question uh, because again, the subjective kind of element comes in. You read yourself into others. You say everybody can do this, but can they? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Mm, definitely, Professor. And But I would also like to uh, understand if this is also, for me, it has been art. Uh, however, what about the kinesthetics? Like this is more an embodied um, practice. So any embodied practice, it may not be art for someone else, but maybe some other embodied practice uh, that would uh, work for them. And we need to make space for that. In fact, I've not mentioned this in my uh, presentation today, but as I was finishing the research, my concern was, I'm talking so much about embodied and embodied. What about someone who cannot move, right? Will they never be able to experience this uh, ritual? And uh, so that is again a limitation because when we speak so much about embodied, there are people who may not be able to explore it in a way uh, because of physical challenges. Uh, and how do we then make absolutely. space for it to still be embodied for them? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Hima. Because when you think about your work, the, the wider uh, possibilities of your work, your work as 
something more universal than personal transformation, then it's exactly these questions. And you're absolutely right. Then that, that engaging with the person that you want to help uh, would develop the modalities through which they can engage with their own processes. Thank you. Thank you, Devashish. I mean, you know, I just wanted to, to point out, and Hema, you, I think you know this well, is that Jung said, although the, like if you, he would encourage people to create their own red book, right? To, to actually, you know, go, th keep a dream journal, keep a journal of visions and, and their thoughts on these, but also to draw or paint. And he said, although the book has to be precious, the work should not be aestheticized. So he preferred it if, with his clients if it remained rough because it, it, it gave a clearer path to their unconscious material. Whereas if it was overly aestheticized, then there was a, a conscious reworking that sometimes created a block that would make it more difficult to get down beneath the surface. Um, I also wanted to just point out really quickly that the, the fourth, the wholeness, the stage of wholeness, the number four, is the one of the next stage. So as you complete this stage of uh, your book, having mm -hmm. completed your dissertation, mm -hmm. then that becomes the foundation for the next that, stage. Of, okay, of that's beautiful. Yeah. So uh, just one question. I And we've talked about this before, but I would really like to hear you speak about it a, a little bit more. I'm, you know, my knowledge of yoga is, is limited. And so I had asked you a question, uh, misunderstanding the Bindu chakra and its place because mm. I associated it with the Ajna. So could you go, maybe just go over for, for all the folks who might not know the difference between these two chakras a little bit more deeply? Yes, and I would um, um, thank you for that question, Stefan, because even for me, that was, I, I was not aware of the Bindu chakra before this research. And um, it is not a chakra that is actually acknowledged in yoga, um, it's very in in like the pure form of yoga, except maybe the tantric um, yoga. Uh, and however, the chakra that you are talking about, like the Ajna chakra, is is at the forehead. And uh, when I initially made this drawing and things, I was wondering. I was also confused. Like I thought maybe it should be here. Why is it at the back of my head? And then when I went uh, uh, looking up, and that's when I found the Bindu chakra, which is supposed to be at the, uh, which is placed. And like I showed in the figure in my presentation, and um, of course the you know the way one is connected to it is the Ajna Chakra is also called as the third eye, and it's uh, connected to intuition, uh, spiritual insight. While um, the Bindu Chakra, like I said, is like the connection of the finite to the infinite, like like kind of like a, a coming together of the unconscious and the conscious um, uh, centers, and. Um, yeah, so this one in terms of position and of course then in terms of how they play a role in one's, um, uh, yeah, in, in yoga itself or in understanding oneself. Um, this is what I understand from the two chakras, but of course, you know, we have Professor Devashish, if he would like to share something more on this, um, we'd be more than, maybe that'll be no, I, I, enlightening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. No, I think uh, that you're you're absolutely right. The thing that I'd like to mention about it is that uh, there is a part where you are talking about the ladder and the other traditions that refer to mm. chakras. Mm. You talk about the ladder, and at that point, you're actually talking about seven rungs. And mm. actually, the whole notion of the seven chakras is is really a, a kind of a generalization that occurs around the 16th century. But if you look at tantric texts, uh, there are all variations from four to, you know, 108, 100, yeah, 108. Mm -hmm. uh, so chakras, uh, you know, the ones that we can name as the Ajna Chakra, the Muladhara, et cetera, uh, are just a sort of certain standardization that takes place around the 16th mm -hmm. century. But many other names and many other, uh, you know, systems of chakras uh, actually exist in all practical traditions. And certainly you are experiencing something and you're experiencing a chakra and you're finding a, a name for it. And I think that's what matters. 
This is uh, fascinating to me because also in pretty much in the same century or around the same time, there was a standardization of the spherot in, in the Kabbalah, whereas the spherot were many and varied and in given different forms of representation, then they were standardized into what we know them to be today. Very interesting. interesting yeah. So I'm wondering, Dr. Eviat, do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah, if I could ask just one more question. Yes. What I really like, the Himalata, how you brought together these different cultures and different theorists. And I saw that you found a lot of resonance between uh, what you read and what you presented. And I'm also curious, maybe it didn't happen, but I'm just curious if you had experienced a sort of dissonance in your embodied experiences and those different perspectives? Yes. Yes, I did. I think even when I came with the first, what I experienced at the basement, I, like I said, the first thing was denial. I was like, no, this doesn't exist. Like, I'm not any more trapped. I'm not, you know, so there's like, why is this image coming up for me? Um, so that was the first response that I had of denial of kind of like angry, like really I'm sitting down to do this research and this is the first image that comes up for me. Like, why do I have to work on this again? You know, and so a lot of that kind of, uh, uh, so it's not like I resonated with everything that came up. There was resistance, there was denial. And before really saying that, okay, you know, so the, all that is part of the um, reflection um, book that I have kept along with this process where it's a process of recording the reflections that are um, that emerge for me and um, yes that uh, that yes there have been moments when the image itself was like you know despite knowing despite being an art therapist and saying oh image and this has to say something about me sometimes it's like no I think this image just is coming up I don't want to look into it so all those moments have also been there yes Okay, thank you. And Devashish, I'll give you the last word. Do you have any any other questions? I have no other questions. Okay, wonderful. So I I guess at this point, um, we asked Judy. Judy, where are you? There you are. If you can create a breakout room for the three of us, and we'll go and deliberate, and uh, the rest of you can kind of chat amongst yourselves. If you have any questions for Emma, please ask. And uh, we'll be back soon. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> um, I see people are eager, eager to talk to you. So I'm going to um, go ahead and let Pooja take the first question there. Yes. Pooja. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, Pooja. Yeah. And I read your chat message. Yeah. Yes. Would you like to say a little bit more on that? Oh, um, I'm usually bad with details. Uh, so I don't remember the full story. But it's uh, Jeshtha Nakshatra sits in the zodiac sign of Scorpio, which yes. uh, and the story around it, which I at a very high level remember, is uh, it always has a sense of being unsupported, but a very high sense of independence as well. So it's uh, mm -hmm. both of those, and because it is sitting in the, it's actually a, uh, I think in in terms of how somebody feels, uh, I actually have my moon in that in that nakshatra mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so you often you will uh, it's also ferocious it's a lot of emotional courage in there uh, but you have to process a lot of these things throughout your life if you have certain planets in there but the overall mm -hmm. story is uh, you would if you have either that as your ascendant um, rising or or you have a planet or something in there especially the moon you would you would feel unsupported but at the same time you would be given all of the tools uh, to be fiercely independent so it's a beautiful combination um, there's a lovely story i think the ruler is indra mm -hmm. um, but yeah that story i'd leave you uh, to search on your own because i'm horrible with sure, sure, detail. Sure. <laughs> uh, my question Thanks. to you was uh, i'm sorry no i was just thanking you for bringing that to light and i'll definitely yeah. look that up yeah, you're welcome. And uh, the question I wanted to ask you, I'm actually a newbie in this East West Psychology PhD program, and I am contemplating um, taking the um, creative visitation pathway. Is that what you took? 
no, I don't think so. I think, uh, I don't know, Judy, is mine I'm falling under that? No, no, it's not. No, you're in, you're in the PhD. No, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Because with, with the process, I felt like that's what yours was, but apparently not. Now, that was my only simple question, but thank you for everything. It was, I had goosebumps at several points when you were sharing and the way you were presenting. So thank you for bringing that into the research process. Thank you, Pooja. Hello, Hema. Congratulations. Thank you, Ishtar. So thank you for being you. here. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful presentation and such a powerful process that you went through. Um, it's funny that, you know, the, um, Debashish pointed out that it was a really, it was a really good representation of an East-West dissertation. Because I wrote that down, I was like, no, Debashish, don't say what I was thinking. <laughs> because it seems like you, your two homes, um, you know, the East and the West, and that you so well articulated and are living in those two like it just felt so palpable that the embodied the embodied practice is not just integral yoga it's it's young and the way you brought those two together is just absolutely beautiful besides your artwork is absolutely beautiful just incredible gifts i i sort of wish that we could have seen more um and i'm curious have you been working with any of your art therapy clients in similar parallel process ways? So not in this specific process, Ishtar, because this is something I really am working for the developing. first time. Like, yes. Uh, however, uh, uh, the process of art therapy, yes, I do work with them on other, you know, the way of uh, uh, using Jungian psychology. And uh, that's how I've been trained to work as an art therapist. But you, this tool, no, this embodied ritual, not yet. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's uh, very new for me also. Uh, and throwing up a lot for me every time I engage with it. So I'm not yet ready to um, take it to participants or clients. Mm -hmm. But you will, I hope, because it was a, yes. a very powerful, very transformative process and really beautiful. So thank you. Congratulations again. Thank you, Ishtar. Sorry, I was muted. We're all back. I, uh, I, think I guess the first thing that I want to say, just not to keep you in suspense, Hema, is that uh, we had a very quick deliberation and all three of us agreed that your work is really remarkable and that you very much deserve uh, the, your PhD. So welcome to the ranks Thank of you. PhDs, Dr. Swaminathan. Thank you, Stefan. That means a lot. You're welcome. We have uh, a, just a couple of minor things, actually mm -hmm. only one of them in the dissertation, um, and the other is kind of for moving forward with your work. Um, the Debashi should pointed out that, that some of the diacriticals in your Sanskrit are, are incorrect or incomplete. So mm -hmm. go back in and just work on the diacriticals and those quotations. Mm -hmm. uh, so that they're as accurate as you can get them. But that's really the only thing in the dissertation itself. And there's also, a, a, I guess, a plea in a way for what, going forward with this work as you take it out into the world, maybe for you to lean a little bit more into articulating the use of this to fellow art therapists, which means um, finding a way to take it out of the personal and into the more general universal um, applicability you know, using a more universal language if you write any more papers or if you give presentations. But none of this has to be attended to in the dissertation itself. The dissertation is wonderful as it is. So that's just something that you can think about as you as you go forward. Okay. 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 So congratulations. I want to also just thank Dr. Uh, Avia Volfa once again for participating in this and Debashish as well, of course. And um, we'll leave the, uh, the room open so that you can have uh, further conversations with folks. And you and I can connect uh, in the following days, okay? Okay, thank you. A sincere thanks to um, my committee members. I think they've been really, really helpful. 
Um, and I think Stefan has met with me for uh, 52 weeks of the year through last year, every week checking in. So that has been helpful. And Dr. Evia has been so prompt with her uh, responses, with her um, questions, with her feedback. I've never had to ask, never had to ask for anything. It was just all given such a nurturing environment. And I think this whole concept of embodied ritual um, came about when I spoke to Devashish. So he just heard me once and he said, what you're talking about is an embodied ritual because I was talking about, I was all over the place. Um, and so he said, this is what you're talking about, isn't it? And got me to think about it. So thank you sincerely. You're welcome, Hema. And I just want to point out to those folks who are here who are working on their dissertations and um, that Hema is a, was a model student. She has an extraordinary capacity to listen deeply and uh, to take constructive criticism. There was very little criticism in that way, but, uh, and she was an excellent partner, an excellent person to work with um, to help flesh out her work. So something to keep in mind as you, as you go forward in your um, PhD work here in East West. Anyway, I'll say goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you so much. It has been really a joy. And uh, yes, I also say the same as Dr. Julich. You have a model to go to if you have questions about your dissertation. Congratulations, Hima. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Congratulations. <laughs>